I am Faria Rashid. On behalf of Action in Bangladesh, welcome you all to the thematic session two, Water, Gender, and COVID-19 Nexus, on the second day of sixth International Water Conference on Water, Climate, and Justice in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. After having a good start of the conference with the opening session and thematic session one yesterday, today we will be having two thematic sessions. At this session now, we have with us Ms. Farah Kabir, Country Director, Action in Bangladesh, Dr. Krakening Grasham, Postdoctoral Researcher, Water Security and Society, School of Geography and the Environment, University of Oxford, the UK, Lubna Mariam, Dance Artist and Cultural Activist, also, General Secretary and Artistic Director, Shadhana Bangladesh, Dr. Mahbuba Nasreen, Professor and Director, Institute of Disaster Management and Vulnerability Studies, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, Rahima Sultana Kajal, Member, General Assembly, Action in International Bangladesh Society, Hina Lotia, Independent Expert, Climate Change and Water Resource Management, Pakistan. Before we start the session officially, I would like to share some housekeeping rules first. Dear speakers, please turn on your microphone when you are speaking and turn it off when you are finished. Please turn your video on while speaking. For the remaining time, Please feel free to keep the video on or off as you prefer. Dear participants, as this is an online conference, your video and microphone are turned off to avoid sudden disruption during the presentations. For the question and answer session, you can write your questions at the chat box and the moderator will take up the questions and the relevant presenters will answer you. Now, I would like to request you all to turn your camera for a group photo. Dear participants, please, everyone, turn on your video for a group photo. Thank you, everyone, for the photo. Now, I would request Ms. Farah Kabir, Country Director, Action in Bangladesh, to deliver the opening remarks and also to continue the session with her moderation. Ms. Farah Kabir. Thank you, Faria. Again, a very warm welcome on behalf of myself and Action Aid Bangladesh and all the friends from Bangladesh to all of you who are joining us today. Uh, um, it is an afternoon here, but I'm sure we are working on different uh, time zones and therefore, um, uh, good morning, good evening, where you are. Um, this session, We've had some very interesting to uh, beginning, 
we had the opening session and where uh, the focus is of course on water and the rights of the rivers, but the presentations looked at different dimensions. And uh, in the presentation from Professor Imtiaz, there was an emphasis on climate, water, gender dimension. And of course, the other speakers spoke about the rights of rivers. Today, this session will be focusing on, the, uh, on water, gender, and COVID-19. Now, I don't know if it was by design or by default, all the speakers in this session are women. It could be that because the number of women in leadership globally is increasing. And it, uh, this morning I saw a video where uh, the number of women presidents all over the world has multiplied. So that's encouraging, empower women and they lead. And if they lead, they lead with the gumption and a lot of sense, I would say. Unfortunately, water is not in the control of women or the people, and uh, depending on where you are located. But water and now climate crisis are central for achieving global goals on sustainable development. Um, I don't mean that we should be um, encouraging climate crisis, but we need to address climate crisis because it leaves its impact on the water, the source of water, rivers, and it reveals itself through the alterations in the water cycle um, with the, the you know, extreme pro and prolonged droughts or precipitation, which leads to floods. In climate change in the last 20 years have demonstrated that uh, it, it impacts on food security, it causes displacement, it has led to harmful practices, and there's the gender-based violence that has increased. And in COVID-19, unfortunately, whatever information and active research that has come forward, it is showing that there's an increase in uh, gender-based violence. Now, we know that the entire COVID period in this pandemic, the emphasis is on hand washing, on sanitation, but 50% of the global population lack access to adequate sanitation. And uh, I believe uh, um, uh, as per uh, reports that 75% of the households in low income and middle income countries are unable to wash their hands with soap and water. They don't have access to the clean water. And this is why Action Aid also thinks that inequality and uh, access to water and services are non negotiable for everyone. Now, the king impact of COVID 19 on water, food system, its gender dimensions, all this will be coming up in the different presentations this afternoon. And I'm looking to a very exciting few presentations and conversation. I would really request all our uh, participants who are joining us through Zoom or our own Facebook. La yesterday we had uh, 2,500 uh, friends joining through Facebook. Please send in your questions or your suggestions in the chat box and we will have a Q&A session. So with these few words, again, I welcome you to the second day of the sixth International Conference on Water. It's over to you, Faria. Okay, uh, maybe we are having some technical problem. I'll now invite Dr. Catherine Gresham, who's a postdoctoral researcher, water security and society in the School of Geography and Environment, University of Oxford, UK. Uh, Catherine, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Farah, for that wonderful overview and lovely introduction. Um, hello, everybody from Oxford uh, in the UK. Um, shall I share my own screen for the presentation? Is that how it's going to work? Yeah. 
if you wish to, or, or uh, as your presentation is also with my team, they can also upload it. What would you like, prefer? Um, yeah, I can do it. Then I can um, go through the okay. slides. Sure. Oh, actually, no, please, can you do it? Because I have my notes on a separate, um, a separate uh, page. Is it possible for you to share it? That's great, thank you so much. Um, yes, so as Farah said, my name is Catherine Gresham and I'm joining today from Oxford in the UK and I'm working in the REACH program. So REACH is a global research program that's funded by UK aid from the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. And we work in Africa and Asia, mostly in Ethiopia, Kenya and Bangladesh. And uh, we're also working with Professor Mabuba Nazreen, who's also in this session. So it's great to be uh, speaking uh, with Professor Mabuba today as well. So I'm a social scientist and I study the relationship between water, politics and human development. And that's to produce evidence to highlight poverty and inequalities uh, for water security policy and practice. And today I'm going to share with you a values-based approach uh, to measure gendered water security risks with evidence from a case study in rural Ethiopia. So as you can see here on this slide, I've got four takeaway key messages. So the first one is that values are inherent in water risks, which means that water risks cannot be measured without understanding values. This is quite a theoretical idea and I'll show you um, some, some ideas about this from the literature, which is, um, which is very interesting and critical to my message. And secondly, I'll show from my research from rural Ethiopia that water risks are gendered. That's namely that men, women and children have different values and water insecurity puts them at risk in different ways. Thirdly, I'm going to show how I think that household adaptation to water insecurity can be viewed as a value maximization strategy. And finally, I'm going to discuss the policy implication of this, that is understanding local values is absolutely key for resilience building. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about COVID-19, but I will echo the message that Farah said, is that there are too many households across the world that are water insecure and don't have access to water and soap for hand washing. And controlling the spread of COVID-19 is so, that's so important for controlling the spread. So the more work we can do to improve household water security, the better. And I hope that this values-based approach will go some way towards doing that. So I'm just going to start here with a, with a quote from 1999 from Anthony Giddens that says, there is no risk that can even be described without reference to a value. So this idea of values being inherent in risk, it's not a new idea, it's been around for decades. But the problem is in the water sector, we tend to think about water risk in a natural science framing, uh, which insufficiently explores what is at risk and for whom. So we think about water risk as hazard times exposure times vulnerability times capacity, which is the World Bank definition. And it's a very quantitative and biophysical approach to understanding water risk. Whereas conversely, if we look at the definition by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the definition is the potential for consequences where something of value is at stake and where the outcome is uncertain, recognizing the diversity of values. So this is a definition that I think really captures um, values and also the fact that values are not the same, are not universal, but differ from place to place. And then just at the bottom there, there's another piece of literature, Jepson et al in 2017, called for the inclusion of values about water that extend beyond utilitarian ones. So really bringing in diverse human values to under, better understand water insecurity. So if we go to the next slide. 
This really quite neatly brings me on to my case study in rural Ethiopia. So given that risk cannot be understood without values, it then follows that risk cannot actually be measured without understanding values. So I did a case study in a rural community of Ethiopia. So it's in the very top area of the map, the, the red area or the pink area. It's a community, it's a drought prone and semi-arid area and the community are nomadic agro-pastoralists. They have permanent households in the southern part of the red area and they migrate to the northern part um, in the dry season where there's a river for access to water uh, for their livestock. So we go on to the next slide. Uh, this is a photo here um, that's taken in the community. So these photos were taken by Elise Shota, who is the Knowledge and Communications Exchange Manager for the REACH program based in Oxford. And Elise and I traveled together to the community and she captured these beautiful photographs. Um, so the, the district is in the Aromia region of Ethiopia. And these, this, these houses you can see here are the traditional houses. Um, that you find in that area. And these are the permanent houses that you can find in um, the southern part of the village. And then in the next photo, it really shows how, how, dry, how dry the area is, you can see there. And um, that's again in the southern part of the, of the community. Um, so in the dry season, that's why some members of the household are migrating north to where there's a river to get access to water. And then on the next slide, you can see here, these are some girls who, are, who have traveled from the houses to a nearby canal to connect, collect water for use um, in the home. And then on the next slide in the final photograph, you can see here are some uh, young boys who have shepherded um, the small ruminants to the canal for water, so there's sheep and goats. And you can just see the huge number of livestock that the, that the community have here and you know how, how much water is actually going to be needed by those animals. And that sort of shows why they're migrating uh, in the dry season. So we can go on to the next slide now. So these are the main water risks that are being experienced by the community members. And the ones that are being experienced more frequently are on the right hand side and the ones that are being experienced less frequently um, are on the left hand side. Um, so these risks came from the values that the community expressed to me in focus group discussions and in interviews. And in the next slide, I'll talk, talk about, um, oh, sorry, if you wouldn't mind going back to the slide before, <laughs> sorry. I'll just talk through these risks quickly, sorry, before I go into the next slide. So. Um, yeah, on the left, we've got um, interregional conflict. So the, the district sits on the border of two regions that do, and conflict springs up from time to time. Um, there's crop destruction when there's a drought, the, the crop can be destroyed. Um, children often miss school because of collecting water. If the crops are destroyed and the livestock die, then there can be food insecurity in the household. And then we go into the risks that are experienced more commonly is first, the psychosocial impacts of water scarcity. So feeling very worried about there not being enough water, um, waterborne diseases, <clears throat> um, increased household expenditure to access water and to access food. We know at times of drought that food prices tend to increase and uh, the physical health impacts of fetching water that you know, women and children are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So yes, on the next slide, thank you. Um, <clears throat> what I found in this, in this case study is that the water risks are gendered because of gendered values and also because of gendered cultural norms. So women are usually the household water managers. So this is a quote here from a lady who lives in the village called Dre Boru, who said, you have to travel long distances to find water. It is very tiring. There was a day when we left in the morning and came back during the night. And then men experience the emotional burden of being the household provider. So if there's a drought and it results in the crop destruction or the loss of livelihood, men tend to feel very disturbed and a huge great worry for not being able to provide food and income for their family. 
And then you have children as well. Children are much more vulnerable to waterborne diseases and are likely to miss school as well due to uh, water insecurity. So there's the men and women and children experiencing water risks in quite different ways. And then if we go on to the next slide. So this here, I won't go into too much detail here, but this is just an infographic that in the, you can see on the left in the southern part, that's where the, um, the community lives in the wet season, where they have their farms, the schools, the health center, the transport into the town, um, and their farms are there. And then in the northern part, that's where part of the household migrates to in the dry season, where there's a river and so they can access water for, for their livestock. Um, and part this um, adaptation strategy, adaptation to the water insecurity in the village can be thought of as a value maximization strategy. So this migration is resulting in trying to protect, it comes from a place of trying to protect as many values as possible. And what that migration allows is the fact that their household income is protected, their food security is protected, and children's education is protected as well, because part of the household migrates and the children tend to stay behind so that they can go to school. But there are still values at risk. Health is still at risk from waterborne diseases. Household water access is still insecure. So this offers really, really interesting insights for policymakers to identify the values that are still at risk, even with local adaptation strategies, to find the best avenues for intervention and investment. And then if we go on to the final slide, the key policy implication of this research, you know, what is the point of doing this and understanding all these values? I think that understanding values is absolutely critical for resilience building. It is very difficult for to build resilience in a community if we do not already understand the existing socio-ecological resilience of communities. You know, these communities have been living in these very fragile climatic environments in living with water insecurity for generations and they have very complex and context specific adaptation strategies. So we don't really want to interrupt, but we want to find a way to strengthen that resilience, to build resilience. And we want to make sure that the approaches that we take are contextual so that they don't result in maladaptation. And I'll just finish with a quote from one of my colleagues. Uh, For progress towards the sustainable development goals, policy needs to reflect how the plurality of risks and values are conceptualized. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to welcoming any questions you might have. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, you kept to the time almost. And uh, (laughs) uh, uh, all those who are listening and participating, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. And, you know, you emphasize on a very important aspect, values, you know, and for me, uh, it's also, you know, uh, politics is personal or personal is politics, because I remember um, the whole floods and all my visits to the communities uh, after Cyclone Cedar, uh, you know, um, how the drinking water was gone. The women could only walk for miles to get a bottle of water, which was safe enough, and they would bring it for their child. And they would ensure that the child has that safe water, but they were drinking whatever water was available from the Sundarbans and suffering from diarrhea and so on. Or even when, it's so personal. When my uh, youngest son was born, it, it was in 1988, 1st September. As I was going to the hospital, the water was coming into Dhaka. And almost I wouldn't have had access to the doctor and the facilities because m- movement in Dhaka city stopped. And that water was because of this wrong planning, urban planning and, and, and um, the, the designing of uh, dams around the city, uh, around Dhaka, and so on. So it's it impacts us on multiple ways, and it's very critical to understand the values uh, and risk for adaptation as well. 
Um, can I now move on to uh, Lubna Mariam, who's going to be speaking on, on uh, bringing in a, uh, the artistic and uh, also uh, rituals and other dimensions to water of rafts, rivers, and ritual performance. You know, it's interesting you talk about ritual performance, Lubna, but uh, after CEDOR, when we went around the, to the communities, some of the communities were saying, we don't have any water even to for the immersion of goddess Durga. That was like, they were not even thinking about drinking water, but an important ritual in their life could not be performed. So it's over to you, Dumna. So can I share my uh, screen? Do you, yeah, you want my team to help you? No, I'll share my own. Okay. Thank you, uh, Action Aid, and thank you, Farah. And actually, thank you to Catherine for setting the stage with your wonderful presentation and values, because uh, cultural systems are all about values. Okay, I go straight into my presentation of rafts, rivers and rituals, cultural services of aquatic ecosystems. Okay. Uh, Bangladesh, a low-lying riverine country on the northern littoral of the Bay of Bengal, is not just a confluence of rivers, but also a land that has witnessed the conversions of mystic beliefs from far and wide. For centuries, these waterways have inspired folk tales which have been told and retold in folk ritual performances. More often than not, the underlying message of these performative rituals is one of plurality and diversity. Amongst these tales, there cannot be a more awesome tale than that of Behula and Lokhindor, where the new bride carries the corpse of her spouse to the heavens in an epic journey on a raft across seven rivers seeking justice and retribution against the mighty serpent goddess Manasa. As the legend goes, the hapless Brahmin merchant Chan Sadaga refused to worship Manasa Devi, the mind-born daughter of Shiva. Manasa retaliated by taking the life of Chan's youngest son, Lokhindor. Thus began the epic battle between Lokhindor's newlywed bride, Bihula, and the mighty serpent goddess. Nothing could be more Bangladeshi than an exciting day-long riverine processional performance with actors dressed as Behula, Lokhindor, and other characters of the state of Manasa. Competing groups take out colorfully decorated boats, stopping at seven ghats or wharfs, emulating Behula's journey till each boat stops at the designated housel where the jioni or bringing back from dead last act is performed to bring the hapless Lokhindar back to life. Amazingly, this tale is performed every year on the rivers of Tangai on Srabon Shankranti, the last day of the month of Srabon, as a riverine performance on colorfully bedecked boats. In the Gregorian calendar, Shabon Shankranti is around mid-August. Sadly, the government of Bangladesh has de declared August a month for mourning when no festivities can take place. So a heritage practice that has been happening for more than a few centuries is certainly under threat. But why are these practices important? Known as Shaone Dada, the offering of Shabon, the ritual performances are executed against a manot or pledge by a householder to appease Manasa in the hope of getting a boon from her in the form of good health for the household or to overcome other such minor household woes and obstacles. These performances are in fact efficacious. Importantly, the ritual is participated by both Hindus and Muslims from marginalized communities. Both pay obeisance to the goddess before embarking on the journey. This folk ritual performance is an illustration of the relationship between the people of Bangladesh and the riverine ecosystem around them. Ecosystem services constitute a systemic framework conceptualizing the diversity of interconnected values that they provide to humanity. Cultural services and the values they promote are under threat due to various reasons, amongst them, the solely 
utilitarian exploitation of nature. I, I won't go into the video. Uh, we'll go on to uh, celebrating Shakti or female energy. The narrative belongs to the genre of Mangal Kavyas, Bangla narrative poems written approximately between the 15th and 18th centuries, depicting the greatness of popular indigenous deities as well as the social scenario. The poems are known as Mangal Kavyas because it was believed that just listening to these poems about the deities brought both spiritual and material benefits. The three part schema followed in the poem relates a conflict between male and female deities followed by retribution and the ultimate resolution ending in glorification of the female deity and a woman's power of moral persuasion. The cast are really from a fixed group and most times are not professional performers coming from alternate professions such as landless labor, cobblers, carpenters, etc. They are mostly Muslims. Some performers are ojhas or faith healers with the power of healing snake bites and other ailments. The river provides a transitional or liminal space between life and death. This liminality provides an ideal platform for the transformation of the meek housewife Behula into a powerhouse of determination and giving glimpses of that unused evolutionary potential in mankind. Processional events are public performances richly expressive of symbolic meanings. Such meanings are constructed by the movement of participants through space and time in a special order on a particular occasion. Appeasing the deity with bhog. The term bhog designates an offering to appease deities during the procession, each boat stops at seven different ghats or wars where the performers perform rites and set afloat the offerings contributed by onlooking villagers. Bhog for the deity. There is always a bevy of worshippers, as you can see from the images, Hindu and Muslim standing on the banks with their own contributions of offerings. Here too, I will not play the video. Ah, I was inspired by Dr. Intiaz Ahmed's very humorous presentation yesterday and, and sharing these uh, images. Children will always be children. And I was very lucky to be able to click this uh, sequence of images with such a lot of food literally floating around. I have noticed that the children always uh, uh, try to go and get it first of all for themselves. But what surprises me is the tolerance for these childish pranks. But jokes aside, play and ritual. Rituals and plays have an affinity as both are executed outside normative social factors and exhibit systemic features of meta-communication. I'll uh, just fleetingly tell you that there is another way of presenting these uh, legends. It's through uh, scroll paintings, but that's for another day. Fluid spaces of ritual and river. The great folklorist A.K. Ramanujan maintains South Asian traditions are indissolubly plural and though conflicting, they are responses to previous and surrounding traditions. If normative society is viewed as structure, responses against those structures or anti-structures will always arise to invert, subvert, and convert their neighbor. However, a transfusion of tradition continues to an imaginary permeable membrane. In the liminal or transition space of rituals or rivers, the compartments break down and the space becomes a fluid mix of traditions. There are many theories about ritual theater as a tool for pluralism. Victor Turner describes rituals as a tripartite scream of separation, transition, and integration, where he characterizes the transitional space as liminal space where there is an effacement of the normative structure due to the leveling of personalities, a protostructure of human relatedness or, or communitas does away with differences. It is this protostructure which is the seedbed of creativity. In the Rasa theory of Indian aesthetics, theater is described as an extra empirical experience where emotions have no purposivity, artha kriya karitva, thus also allowing a leveling of emotions leading to universalization or sadhana nikaran of responses. Though the safeguarding and promotion of culture is in itself an end in itself, 
At the same time, it contributes directly to many of the SDGs, safe and sustainable cities, decent work and economic growth, reduced inequalities, the environment promoting gender uh, equality and peaceful and inclusive societies. The indirect benefits of culture are accrued through the culturally informed and effective implementation, implementation of the development goals. So now we come to safeguarding strategies. Uh, the first one is heritage branding, developing heritage sensitive intellectual property protection strategies can give communities greater control over the commercialization of the heritage while contributing to its safeguarding and ongoing availability, uh, viability. Cultural tourism, rivers are an important source for cultural tourism, which should be managed in such a way that fulfills economic, social and aesthetic needs while maintaining cultural integrity and essential ecological progress. Research and documentation. People seek and interact with aquatic ecosystems such as seas, rivers, and wetlands to obtain non-material benefits provided by cultural ecosystem services. However, cultural ecosystem services are often undervalued, underprotected, and neglected from ecosystem services studies. And lastly, this is something which I need not uh, say to Action Aid, which is doing such a wonderful job with the Water Museum. Community involvement in heritage management is of primary importance. So I come to the end of my pre presentation. And though it's almost like uh, taking coal to Newcastle, what needs to be said needs to be said. Water in its many facets matters for humans as the social, cultural, ideological, and religious roles of water include deep ontological relations and identities ranging from personal perceptions and gender relations to rainmaking and fertility rights for the benefit of both the individual and for society as a whole. Cultural services also enhance perceptions of cosmological realms and religious beliefs. Without incorporating water as a relevant variable for understanding people's identities, cultures, and religions in the past and present, one misses crucial aspects of historical agencies and structures at work in society and religion, which have implications for future developments. So thank you very much, uh, Akshinad. And here I am uh, a little bit like Jack Sparrow, looking into the horizon and wondering why I alone get the good fortune to watch all these incredible performances. And I would really, really like to thank Action Aid and Farah Kabir for allowing me to share a bit of my experience with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lubnapa. Uh, uh, it's so amazing and interesting. Both Catherine and you have brought uh, to this conversation values and rituals and, and the significance. You know, even in climate uh, discourse, when we took up the issue of loss and damage, we were emphasizing on not just the economic loss, but also talking about the socio-cultural and heritage and this whole dimension and what it means in, in for communities and how important it is to put this forward. Now, I wanted to try something, if it's okay with all of you, because uh, I can't see the chat box and I can't see questions. Before we go on to the next two presenters and to our expert remarks, Catherine, if you were to ask Lubna a question, what would you ask? And Lubna, if you were to ask Catherine something, what would you like to know from her presentation? Who so Catherine, ask? I give you the floor first. What would you ask Lubna from after listening to and watching her presentation? Yeah, I would like, thank you so much for your presentation. It's so interesting to see the cultural importance of uh, River Iron systems. Um, I would say for the rituals that you talked about, why do you think that water resources protection is so important? Uh, these are riverine uh, rituals because they emulate the journey of Behula, who, who travels, who takes her dead husband's corpse on a raft on a river. In, in fact, uh, the myth also uses the river as a liminal space uh, between two banks, between life and death, because this liminal space uh, uh, gives the behula or the wife the opportunity to transform herself and become something that she isn't. It is, uh, it is like a, a anti-structure. 
if uh, society is normative structure, then the river and the ritual is anti-structure because uh, you wouldn't normally be able to take a dead body uh, overland to the heavens, you know. So even the poet is using the river as a liminal space. Uh, yeah. Now to Lugnapa, what would yeah, you ask I, Catherine? As I was listening to you, uh, Catherine, I just wanted to know, how is the river used culturally in mm. those uh, wonderful places that you work? In Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Yeah, I think in, in that particular case study, I wasn't fortunate enough to visit the river, so I don't have much knowledge about how it's being used culturally. But it's it's so important for their for livelihoods, and I'm sure there are um, cultural rituals around it, which would be very interesting to uh, explore, absolutely. Because water always inspires some sort of play. You know, uh, do, do they swim in the water? Because here in Bangladesh, we swim, we drink, we bathe. It's so integral to our lives, the river. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that's, that's the same in Ethiopia as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you to both of you. I mean, you know, again, the, the use of water and the, and the play part of it has a gender dimension. You know, when we are growing up in our different uh, parts of the country, women, uh, girls go out swimming in the ponds and the, but the moment they reach puberty or they are married off, then all the rules and regulations kick in and you don't but have- One thing I have to, uh, I, I always notice that, you know, with all this parda and hijab going on, uh, we, women in the villages, uh, bathe in the uh, rivers with aplomb, you know, with men walking all around, you know, this is just part of what they have done for centuries. It's also because it's uh, cheap, because, uh, you know, sure. affordability is an issue, access and affordability, and therefore the poorer you are in the in order, you take use of public uh, water bodies and so on. So despite all these regulations, uh, they could not uh, stop uh, the use of ponds or women bathing. So there's a whole different discourse around that. I'm sure there now, is. Yeah. So now I'm going to go to Mahbuba Nasri, Dr. Mahbuba Nasri, the professor and director, Institute of Disaster Management at the University of Dhaka. Mahbuba, you're going to be looking at it now very much from the urban perspective. So over to you, Mahbuba. Thank you very much, Farah. Uh, and I have been listening to the two important paper, uh, Catherine's work, I'm just a little bit familiar with as a uh, part of the rich uh, research group and Lubna Moriams is uh, like the area I would like to see more from the eco-feminist perspective that I have been working. And I think there are scant of literature is not enough in that um, perspective uh, and only like we see few uh, academic work, but your one is uh, very much relevant uh, to the context of our academic, uh, not only, but also the cultural security. And uh, that is very, I enjoyed a lot. And I would like to have the um, permission to share the screen. There will be two parts uh, of our uh, research. One, I would be setting the scene uh, from uh, my three decade long research. And then I will go to the one of my colleagues and M-Field researcher uh, funded by Oxford. And uh, we are working at Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology um, uh, and Ethiopia, uh, UK and Bangladesh together. Uh, in this water security for the poor project. So, so I would like to share uh, my screen if I get uh, permission, if you allow me. So that's why I'd like to show uh, the name of my colleague. And we are talking about that most of the uh, part that uh, have been covered by uh, Catherine and also Lubna Mariam uh, and uh, Farah Kobir, that why should we talk about um, women and water while we are talking about gender? Why don't we focus on men and other intersectional group also? So if we refer to the intersectional group, that means we are always talking about all. That means uh, water security for the people. 
Then why women? Because it's what we find in our literature that water sector is not that um, gender neutral. And we also find in the literature that uh, women are uh, involved as well as affected. So they are the, like uh, my theory is saying, they are the facing most the challenges when there is water security at the same time, they are also the resilient. So that's how we are uh, saying it because it's the session is for COVID-19. We have also worked uh, on COVID-19 epidemic, how these burdens are becoming uh, more are taking the most of the responsibilities of women and it's become very much challenging for them that uh, the major problem that we have observed during the cyclone Amphan, which is uh, within this um, con subcontinent, which was occurred. And uh, we were, uh, we thought that not many organizations would be working in that um, period. So how they would maintain the, uh, the like cultural identity of for the norms and maintain their sexual and, sexual and reprodu reproductive health. So there's gender-based violence also we have observed while locked down in their homes. So these are the difference that we observed uh, and uh, we have uh, published in, in a blog in the um, reach. So uh, I'm not going to talk about much on the like use of water security. You all know that why women are mostly linked with water security, uh, why they have the primary responsibility of household water security. They are also protector of environment, also water security issues. They also monitor the water quality. They know that which technology which water is clean, which was water is to cook, which water is not to use and for drinking purposes. So that's why we see that many literature is uh, showing that women, water is a feminine power. Um, if not taking it negatively, what is say that uh, it's across culture we see that if we give the example of Ethiopia and all other countries, African, South Asian countries, I'm not going much about it because my researcher will show the other uh, uh, like empirical evidences. So uh, we talk about time limitations. We talk about that um, adolescent girls, like girls are socialized that uh, I think you are uh, looking at this boy who is uh, like just a raft. He is going somewhere or enjoying, but in this kind of urban settlement, the raft is made like made of what? You see that steel taking risk women are the water collector. And there is a right hand side, you can see that there is a, um, a percentage is giving that how many women and girls together collecting water well, globally. And if we look at uh, this, uh, I just had referred to this, you can go, I, I have given the references that uh, during um, uh, crisis situation or disaster situation, it is already on their burden, but when um, Cyclone Amphan hit, what they have done. So we have seen that not only the social or cultural burden of collecting water, but also the psychological problem that that were much more noticed uh, compared to their male counterpart. So that, that's why the new normal, if we say new normal, I think it's it should be named differently, but still we are saying that accessibility, affordability, and their rights, uh, this should be a relational analysis. We need to rethink uh, differently. So now I am going to give the um, microphone uh, to my colleague uh, and uh, my uh, infield researcher uh, who is working on uh, this rich water security in the urban area. We always talk about rural areas. Sometimes urban areas, we just do not focus that much. So I'd like to invite Shamima Pradhan, assistant professor of our institute. Over to you, Shamima. Please unmute. 
Thank you, ma'am, for giving me the opportunity. And I'm Shamima Pradhan. And yes, I'm here to present my part of study findings under each project. The uh, study is based on 1826 household questionnaire survey across 12 communities along Turak River area, eight days of water use behavior survey, six focus group discussion, and 12 key inform interviews, in, including stakeholders from local government youth leader health officials and community water users group. And the next is, next slide, okay. Next slide, please, okay. Uh, the next slide is mainly the focus on the findings on gendered responsibilities of water-related domestic work, and which shows that more than 80%, uh, 80, more than 80 of women remain the highest to do their household activities than men and boys uh, uh, part of the household members. The next part is, and these two uh, photo actually shows everything. You see the women are engaged in various types of household activities, which includes uh, uh, two main water sources of these studied communities. And the one is the Turak River and the other is the motor, electric motor tube, uh, locally known as a submersible pipeline. The women are seen to engage in washing their utensils, uh, washing, uh, washing their clothes, bathing, washing vegetables, and uh, um, collection of water um, in their daily basis in urban context. Thank you. Um, this slide actually shows the how many times they actually engaged in these household activities like cooking, washing clothes, and utensils, and collecting and storing water, uh, and which shows that they starting from the early morning and till night they continuously do this work on the daily basis. Thank you. And the next slide is, and these activities actually take most of the time of their, of a single day. The cooking, uh, cooking takes minimum uh, one and a half hour to two and a half hours. Washing clothes 10 to 30 minutes, washing utensils 20 to 35 minutes, and collecting water takes minimum 10 minutes to maximum two hours in this urban context and bathing 10 to 30 minutes. and. This study is mainly documented only for those, mainly for those communities who do not have their fixed water sources. Okay, the next slide is on the household members responsible for fetching water. And uh, as you see, the women are the mainly responsible to collect water for household necessity than that of the male counterparts. In comparison to girls and boys, girls are seen to mostly engaged in their um, household water collection activities rather than the boys. And these challenges mainly associated with fetching water are mainly faced by the women group, which includes quarrels or conflict with neighbors over water collections, feel uncomfortable of using someone else's sources, and feel unsafe. Sometimes they face physical or sexual harassment, and sometimes if teasing. Um, long queue is very common uh, in, in water collection practices, and uh, sometimes the water they collect is not sufficient to do the various household activities. Sometimes they are in high risk of road accident because they have to they have to cross the road regularly to collect their water. And the next slide is based on the various uh, health related problem of fetching water. Uh, women are the um, women are particularly affected by the burden of carrying this uh, heavy load of um, uh, water container, which includes back pain. And back pain is very common physical burden and mainly found among the uh, women groups of the study population. Skin disease is mostly uh, uh, documented uh, for those community groups who actually interacting with this polluted river water. Um, and uh, tiring for the women is a very common practice after the, uh, going for the fetching water and coming back, they feel very tired. Uh, in its square, uh, worst cases, aversion has also been documented in this study. Okay, the next slide is based on, the, based on uh, uh, all of the study facts findings uh, with the researcher are tied to uh, uh, some uh, policy implications which uh, is which includes the significant investments on infrastructure development or installation uh, setting of a standard water tariff system establishment of gender sensitive water points increase the number of government water points and therefore the women participation in water management activities interventions uh, 
um, at this point, I would like to uh, bring back the floor to Professor Dr. Mahogwanasri, Madam, and thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity and being with me. Thank you. Thank you, Shamima. So I, uh, as a um, uh, respected moderator, uh, that uh, Shamima has done an infill research and still uh, she is writing, I think, for rich. So it will be uh, later uh, shared in journal articles. And so the mm -hmm. finally, I would like to share that what we have to do, how to engender the water security. So that then we uh, already have uh, received so many recommendations from those presentations. So that's why uh, we would like to have like Action Aid, UN Women, and other organizations, Water Aid, and Bangladesh Water Policy, and also those who have been working water for water security or for gen or for achieving achieving SDG Goal Six, like we have been referring to reach so many times. So there are other uh, programs also. So how that gender equality and women empowerment dimension we have to look at. So if we do not have strong indicators and targets, and also if we see that women empowerment uh, like uh, do not uh, set based on the gender targets and in, in indicators, we cannot see that water governance, uh, women's participation will be ensured in water governance. So that's why like Shamima already mentioned about the gender sensitive infrastructures and services. Why infrastructure? Because uh, there are water points, there are water like tubes and other water taps and other services available, which uh, we find there are some gender bias even for locations and others. So that's why sometimes we do not have the enough data on it also. So there are statistical challenges like we don't have gender and sex disaggregated data based on the indicators uh, of water. So that's why we have to look at the uh, target and uh, strong indicators. And there are some information you can find at the, at the end of the um, references and also Action Aid and Water Aid, uh, while they have been um, celebrating the Beijing platform of action and 10th anniversary of UN General Assembly, then um, what's water and sanitation and hygiene uh, these issues uh, come together all the time because they are also intimately linked. So that's why uh, these the focus we have to give on the wash sector as well as water, both. And uh, in context of COVID-19, uh, there is a need for paradigm shift. There is a need to review all the documents that we have done. We are not sure we are uh, prepared for disaster. We are prepared for uh, climate change. We are uh, adopting mitigation approach and also the preparedness activities are going on, but growing water demand, water scarcity, water pollution, water related risk, violence, gender-based violence and sustainable water security also need to adopt new approach. They, these are also the voices from many of the actors who are working on the water security issues. And that's why we are saying water policy, not only government, but others also require massive revision and structural and non-structural solutions. So uh, these are uh, our um, presentation and there are references. I have shared this with ActionAid and I would like to thank you again for giving us opportunity to share a few findings. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mabuba and Shamima. Uh, I can see now the chat box is being polluted, uh, populated, sorry, not polluted. See, I've been thinking too much about the water and pollution and climate and plastic pollution. Anyway, uh, so we will take, uh, pick up those questions and come back to you. But I, before I do that, I really want to bring in um, another uh, 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 speaker and uh, she's based in the southern parts of Bangladesh. So I would like to invite Rahima Sultana Kajol, who's a member of the General Assembly of uh, Action Aid International Bangladesh Society, but she is the founder and executive director of AWAS, and she is a voice to reckon with in the area, Borishal and those areas. So Kajol, uh, are you Kajol, Talking about the experience of women in southern Bangladesh. Ebong, apni bodhe COVID kyo niyash bentai na? COVID shoma kiti shoma shoma. 
আমি কিছু কি আমার এলাকার বিষয়গুলো তুলে আনবো আর কি এক্সপেরিয়েন্স শেয়ারিং আমার থ্যাংক ইউ আপা প্লিজ ক্লোজ ইয়ার্স আচ্ছা হ্যাঁ থ্যাংক ইউ ফারাপা আর অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ ক্যাথরিন লুবানাপা আর নাসরিনাপা অনেক সুন্দর ভাবে তাদের প্রেজেন্টেশন শুনছিলাম আমি আসলে বাংলায় বলবো আর আজকে আমি যাদের কথা বলবো তারা ওয়াটার মিউজিয়াম নামে যে আইডিটি আছে সেই আইডির সামনে তাদের ভেতর থেকে অনেকেই বসে আছেন যারা আজকের এই কথা শুনছেন এবং এর এই আমার কথার সাথে যাদের জীবনযাত্রা জড়িত আছে আমি সবাইকে এখানে যারা উপস্থিত আছেন সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি মূলত বাংলাদেশ হচ্ছে নদীমাত্রিক দেশ এটি আমরা সবাই জানি আবার সেই নদীমাত্রিক দেশের ভেতরে দক্ষিণাঞ্চল হচ্ছে সম্পূর্ণ নদীর উপরে নির্ভরশীল একটি এলাকা তো এই একটা সময় ছিল যখন এই অঞ্চলের মানুষ যখন ঘর বাড়ি করত তখন তারা যেখানে নদী আছে খাল আছে নৌকা হচ্ছে তাদের কমিউনিকেশনের মাধ্যম ছিল এভাবে দেখে দেখেই মানুষ বাড়িঘর তৈরি করত হাট বাজার তৈরি করত স্কুল তৈরি করত এমন কি ইউনিয়ন কাউন্সিল গুলো যে ছিল সেগুলো তৈরি করত সেগুলো খাল এবং নদী নির্ভর হওয়াতে মানুষের জীবন কৃষি কাজ বলি বা এই অঞ্চলের চলমান যা কিছু সবকিছু এই এই নদী কেন্দ্রিক ছিল কলকারখানা যা তৈরি হয়েছে তাও এই নদী কেন্দ্রিক তো আমরা আমাদের ওই এলাকায় যে মানুষ বসবাস করত পুরুষ তো আছেই এবং নারীরা তারাও কিন্তু তাদের দৈনন্দিন জীবনের যে কাজগুলো সে কাজগুলো ছিল নদী বা খালকে কেন্দ্র করে তারা তাদের আহ গোসল থেকে শুরু করে পারিপার্শ্বিক যে কাজগুলো সেগুলো তারা নদীতেই করত পাশাপাশি তারা কৃষি কাজের সাথে যে জড়িত ছিল সেক্ষেত্রে কৃষি কাজ করা ধান সেদ্ধ করা বা বীজতলা তৈরি করা যেগুলো নারীরা করত এবং কৃষিতে যে শেষ কাজ দিত সেটাও আমাদের ওই অঞ্চলের নারীরা এই কাজগুলো আহ করতো এবং তারা আসলে পুরুষের পাশাপাশি কৃষি কাজের আমরা জানি যে কৃষি কাজের যে পনেরোটা কাজ তার ভিতরে সিংহভাগ কাজই নারী করত সেই কাজের বেশিরভাগ কিন্তু পানি নির্ভর এবং এই পানিটা নদী এবং খাল নির্ভর ছিল এটা আমরা সবাই জানি আর একটা বিষয় যেটা আমাদের লুবানাপা তার প্রেজেন্টেশনে দেখিয়েছেন যে সাংস্কৃতিক দিকটা সেক্ষেত্রে কিন্তু আমাদের এই বরিশাল পটুয়াখালী দক্ষিণাঞ্চলের যে ঐতিহ্য গাথা যে গানগুলো যেখানে আমরা আপনারা অনেকে হয়তো শুনেছেন বালা গান পাল্লা গান জারি গান তারপরে হয়লা যাত্রা এগুলো কিন্তু আমাদের এই দক্ষিণাঞ্চলে যেখানে নদী ছিল যেখানে কমিউনিকেশনটা নদীর মাধ্যম হতো সেরকম জায়গায় এইগুলো হতো এবং এগুলো মানুষের জীবন কেন্দ্রিক ছিল এগুলো আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলের নারী শিশু এবং আপনার আমরা সবাই জানি আমাদের রবীন্দ্রনাথের যে কবিতা ছোট আমাদের ছোট নদী চলে বাকে বাকে এই যে কবি কবিতা গুলো যে লেখা ছিল সেগুলো কিন্তু আমাদের এই নদীকে মাথায় রেখে তো দেখা গেছে যে এই আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলের মানুষের সবকিছুই নদীকে ভিত্তি করে হওয়াতে মানুষ অনেকটাই নদী নির্ভর ছিল কিন্তু এখন উন্নয়নের ধারায় যে এখন উন্নয়ন হচ্ছে সেই উন্নয়নের ধারায় যেমন কালবার ব্রিজ তারপরে হচ্ছে এই বাদ এবং আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলে আপনারা অনেকেই জানেন যে এখন তাপ বিদ্যুৎ কেন্দ্র তৈরি হচ্ছে এগুলো হওয়াতে যে জিনিসটা হচ্ছে প্রথমত ওই কালবার ব্রিজ বাদ এগুলো হওয়াতে নদীর নাব্যতা কমে যাচ্ছে নদী শুকিয়ে যাচ্ছে এবং কোথাও কোথাও নদী একেবারেই নাই এবং খালগুলো নাই বললেই চলে এবং এখন ইদানিং যে এই যে তাপ বিদ্যুৎ কেন্দ্র হওয়াতে যতগুলো তাপ বিদ্যুৎ হচ্ছে তার ভিতরে একটি কাজ শুরু হয়েছে সেই কাজ শুরু হওয়াতেই আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলের কিন্তু পরিবেশের অনেক ক্ষতিগ্রস্ত হচ্ছে এই ক্ষতিগ্রস্ততে কিন্তু শুধুমাত্র যে এলাকা ক্ষতিগ্রস্ত হচ্ছে তা না এখানে কিন্তু নারীরাও ওই যে যে ধোঁয়া বা যে একটা একটা কালো একটা আবরণ প্রতিটি গাছে পানিতে নদীতে সেই আবরণটা কিন্তু নারুর জন্য বেশি ক্ষতিকর হচ্ছে তো এরকম জায়গায় ই হওয়াতে যেমন আগে দেখা যেত নারীরা নায়ুর যেত নৌকায় চড়ে এখন আসলে আমাদের অঞ্চলে অনেক নৌকা নাই অনেক এখন নৌকা দেখতে আসলে মিউজিয়ামে যাওয়ার মতো একটা অবস্থা তৈরি হয়ে গেছে নদীতে যেখানে পানি আছে সেখানেও দেখা গেছে যে লবণাক্ততা বৃদ্ধি পেয়েছে 
নদীর যে নদীর লবণাক্ততা বৃদ্ধি পাওয়ার ফলে যে জিনিস হচ্ছে যে আসলে নারী তাদের কাজের ক্ষেত্রে তাদের মানে বেশি জায়গায় বেশি দূরত্বে যে তাদের কাজ করতে হচ্ছে পানি আনতে বা পানির কাজগুলো করতে অন্যের বাড়িতে পুকুরে যেতে হচ্ছে অন্য অন্যের বাড়ি টিউবওয়েল থাকলে সেখানে যেতে হচ্ছে সেখানে বিভিন্ন ধরনের হয়রানির শিকার হচ্ছে বা এক দেখা যাচ্ছে যে এক এই ক্ষেত্রে যে জিনিসটা আমরা যেটা আমাদের কাজ করতে যে উঠে আসছে যে অনেক মাইগ্রেশন এই নদীগুলো মরে যাওয়ার জন্য খালগুলো বিলীন হওয়ার জন্য ওই এলাকা থেকে অনেক মাইগ্রেশন হচ্ছে শিশু বিবাহ বৃদ্ধি পেয়েছে তারপরে হচ্ছে যে অনেক মানুষ যারা ওই ছোট ছোট নদীতে মাছ ধরতো তারা এখন সেই সমুদ্র কেন্দ্রিক অনেক দূরে তাদের যেতে হচ্ছে মাছ ধরতে সেই ক্ষেত্রে দেখা যায় যে বাড়িতে যে নারী ও শিশুরা থাকে তারা বিভিন্ন রকমের যৌন হারানির শিকার হচ্ছে আবার কিছু শিশুরা যারা ওই নদীতে ওই সাগরে বাবার সাথে মাছ ধরতে যাচ্ছে এই ধরনের অনেক ঘটনা আসলে আমাদের দক্ষিণে হচ্ছে তো এই এই যে এত সমস্যা হচ্ছে সেই সমস্যার মধ্যেও আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলে নারীরা আসলে অ্যাডাপ্টেশন যেটাকে আমরা কমিউনিটি বেসড অ্যাডাপ্টেশন বলি যেটাকে আমরা হাউস হোল্ড অ্যাডাপ্টেশন বলি সেই অ্যাডাপ্টেশনের জায়গায় দক্ষতা অর্জন করেছে বিভিন্ন এনজিওর মাধ্যমে যেমন সেখানে একশো নেটও ওই এলাকায় ব্যাপক কাজ করেছে যেমন সেখানে কমিউনিটি মানে উইমেন লিড এমার্জেন্সি রেসপন্স তারপরে হচ্ছে উইমেন রেজিলিয়েন্স ইন্ডেক্স বা ক্লাইমেট চেঞ্জ অ্যাডাপ্টেশনের এরকম অনেক কাজ করার ফলে ওখানে নারীরা কিন্তু এখন তারা অ্যাডাপ্টেশন করে নিচ্ছে তারা এই যে নদীগুলোতে যে স্লুইস দিয়ে লবণাক্ত পানি ঢুকাই ফেলছে সেই জায়গায় তারা আলাদাভাবে বাঁধ নির্মাণ করছে নারীরা সেই বাঁধ নির্মাণ করে তারা পানি সংরক্ষণ মিষ্টি পানি সংরক্ষণ করছে সেই মিষ্টি পানি দিয়ে তারা কৃষিকাজে তারা এই পানি ব্যবহার করছে তারা পারিবারিক কাজে ব্যবহার করছে এবং তাদের প্রয়োজনীয় চাহিদা মিটাচ্ছে কিন্তু এই নারীরা এটা নারীদের জন্য একটা কাজের ব্যাপক একটা প্রেশার তৈরি করছে আবার তারা দেখা যায় যে আমরা যে এই পানি নিয়ে যে সরকারি প্রতিষ্ঠান যারা আছে তাদের কাছেও কিন্তু তারা যাচ্ছে বিভিন্ন সময় তাদের ভিতরে যে লিডিংটা উইমেন যে লিডারশিপটা তৈরি হয়েছে তার মাধ্যমে তারা নিজেরা ছোট ছোট সংগঠন তৈরি করেছে যেমন গণগবেষণা আছে বিভিন্ন সমিতি আছে এই এগুলো তৈরি করে তারা দেখা যাচ্ছে যে আমাদের এই দক্ষিণাঞ্চলে এই কাজগুলো নারীরা করে আসছে একটা জায়গা আমরা দেখছি যে এই যে দক্ষিণাঞ্চলে আপনারা জানি যে সিডোরকালীন সময় যখন সিডোর হয়েছে এই যে আমরা যে রিসেন্ট যে আমফান দেখলাম আমফানের মানে এটা কিন্তু সিডোরের চাই কোনো অংশে কম ছিল না বেশি ছিল কিন্তু ক্ষতির মাত্রা যদি দেখতে যাই তাহলে সিডোরে ব্যাপক ক্ষতি ছিল সেখানে অনেক মানুষের মৃত্যু ছিল মৃত্যু ছিল অনেক ক্ষয়ক্ষতি ছিল কিন্তু এই আমফানে কিন্তু অতটা ক্ষয়ক্ষতি বা মৃত্যু সংখ্যা ওরকম হয়নি কারণটা হচ্ছে আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলের যে নারীরা তারা আসলে বিভিন্ন প্রশিক্ষণ পেয়ে তারা এখন দুর্যোগ মোকাবেলায় তারা পারদর্শী তারা বিভিন্ন সময় এই দুর্যোগে নিজেরা দক্ষতা হয়েছে এবং তারা এলাকায় মানুষের কাছে এই বিষয়গুলো তারা নিয়ে যাচ্ছে মানুষকে তারা জানাচ্ছে এবং যখন এই দুর্যোগ হয় তখন কিভাবে সাইক্লোন শেল্টার গুলো ব্যবহার করবে কে যাবে তাদের পরিচর্যা করা তাদেরকে নিয়ে যাওয়া তাদেরকে উদ্বুদ্ধ করা এগুলো আমাদের ওই দক্ষিণাঞ্চলে নারীরা কিন্তু এই শিখে গেছে তারা এই শিখে যাওয়াতে তারা নিজেরাই এখন এই অ্যাডাপ্টেশন গুলো তারা করছে তারা ফ্যামিলি বেসড যে অ্যাডাপ্টেশন করছে সেখানেও তারা এগ্রিকালচারে দেখা গেছে যে তারা একটা সময় যে কৃষিতে তিনটা চাষ হয় কিন্তু এখন তো যেহেতু পানির সমস্যা নদী বন্ধ ছোট ছোট খাল গুলো বিলীন হয়ে গেছে সেই ক্ষেত্রে তারা এখন ওই কৃষির জমিতে বিভিন্ন ফসল তারা যেমন দেখা যাচ্ছে যে ভুট্টা চাষ করছে তারা তরমুজের চাষ করছে তারা বিভিন্ন শাক সবজির চাষ করতেছে এই চাষগুলো তারা করে তাদের এই যে জমিটাকে কাজে লাগাচ্ছে এবং অনেক কাজে তারা পরিবার ভিত্তিক করছে একটা সময় তাদের ভেতরে যে মহাজন ভিত্তিক মহাজনের উপরে যে নির্ভরশীলতা বৃদ্ধি পেয়েছিল সেটাও তারা নিজেরা সংগঠন করে সেই সংগঠনের মাধ্যমে তারা সরকার থেকে 
নিয়ে কাজ করছে এনজিওদের কাছ থেকে লোন নিচ্ছে পাশাপাশি তারা এই সংগঠনের মাধ্যমে নিজেরা অর্থনৈতিক উপার্জন করে তারা কাজগুলো করতেছে সেখানে এলাকার অনেক এনজিও আছে এবং জি আপা সরি আপনাকে গুছিয়ে নিয়ে আসতে হবে আপনার কোভিড এর সময় নিয়ে এসে আর আপনাকে আমি এক মিনিট দেব জি তো এখন এই যে কাজগুলো তারা করছে তারা কিন্তু নারীরা নদী থেকে অনেকটাই তারা যে নদী নির্ভর ছিল তারা নিজেরা অ্যাডাপ্টেশন করে এখন এই পরিবেশের সাথে খাপ খেয়ে নিচ্ছে আর এই যে রিসেন্ট যে কোভিড কালীন সময় আমরা দেখেছি যে আমি আমি একটা কথা বলি যে আমরা কিন্তু অনেকে ওয়ার্ক ফ্রম হোম করি কিন্তু আসলে কৃষক তারা কিন্তু ওয়ার্ক ফ্রম হোম করতে পারে নাই তারা কৃষিতে কাজ করেছে শিখ তদ্রুপ আমাদের দক্ষিণাঞ্চলে নারীরা তারা কাজ করেছে তারা এখন জানে যে ইসের যেহেতু তারা রোদ্রে কাজ করে ভিটামিন এটা তারা নিতে পারছে এবং তারা তাদের বাচ্চাদেরকে কিভাবে সেই প্রাখা যায় সেই জায়গাটাও তারা করেছে এবং সেই ক্ষেত্রে কিন্তু এনজিওরা এবং অ্যাকশন এডও কিন্তু ব্যাপক সহযোগিতা করেছে বিভিন্ন ভাবে যারা বেশি ক্ষতিগ্রস্ত ওই সময় কাজ থেকে ফিরেছে যারা ঢাকা থেকে চলে গেছে এলাকায় যারা ম্যাগ্রেশন হয়েছিল এরকম যারা চলে আসছে তারাও যাতে আসলে কাজ করতে পারছে বা সাহায্য সহযোগিতা পেয়ে তারা কিন্তু এখন অনেকটাই এই মানে দাঁড়িয়ে গেছে আর কি তো আমাদের ওই দক্ষিণে নারীরা একসময় নদী নির্ভর ছিল এখন তারা নিজেদেরকে আসলে পরিবেশ বর্তমান পরিবেশের সাথে মাঝখানে খুবই খারাপ একটা ই ছিল কিন্তু এখন তারা বিভিন্ন প্রশিক্ষণ বিভিন্ন জায়গায় পেয়ে সচেতন হয়ে তারা নিজেদেরকে অ্যাডাপ্ট করতে পারতেছে এখন এই কোভিডে আসলে আমাদের দক্ষিণ অঞ্চলে অত বেশি আহ কথা আমরা শুনি নেই কিন্তু ওই অঞ্চলের মানুষ কিন্তু আপা যেটা বলা দরকার তারা প্রস্তুতি ছিল প্রত্যেকটা ইউনিয়নে তারা যদি কোভিডে কেউ মারা যায় তাদেরকে কবর দেওয়ার জন্য সৎকার করার জন্য কারা করবে এইভাবে কমিটি করে নারীরা তারা নিজেরা একত্রিত হয়ে যদি করতে হয় গোসল করাইতে কে করতে যাবে এইভাবে তারা একদম নিজেরা সুন্দরভাবে তারা গুছিয়ে রেখেছিল এটা একেবারে একটা মানে উদাহরণ দেওয়া যায় যে আমাদের ওই অঞ্চলের নারী এবং পুরুষ সবাই যদি কোভিডে ক্ষতিগ্রস্ত হয় কি করবে কিন্তু আল্লাহ রহমতে আমাদের দক্ষিণ অঞ্চলে আসলে কোভিডের ওই রকম ভয়াবহতা আসে নাই আমরা এখন পর্যন্ত সেইফ আসি এবং সে সেইফ থাকা আসলে সচেতনতার কারণে তো সেই ক্ষেত্রে প্রধান ভূমিকা রেখেছেন আমাদের দক্ষিণ অঞ্চলের নারীরা তো নারীদেরকে ধন্যবাদ আপা আপনি উদাহরণ নারী নেতৃত্বের এবং আমরা জানি যে ওই এলাকায় একেবারে সাধারণ আমাদের আপারা যারা আমি ওয়াটার মিউজিয়ামে আছেন আপনারাদেরকে আমার স্যালুট সব সময় এবং আপনারা যা নেতৃত্ব দিচ্ছেন বলে ওই এলাকার মানুষ ভালো হিনা আই উইল নাও কাম টু ইউ ফর এক্সপার্ট রিমার্কস আই নট শিওর হাউ মাচ ইউ কুড ফলো ইন বাংলা বাট দেস বিন ইটস বিন interpreted or translated in the um, chat box. Uh, basically, uh, Kajal, Rahima Sultana Kajal was sharing the experience of the South. Uh, if you have any, if you want me to summarize, I'm happy, or if you are okay to go with it. So, uh, it's over to you, Hina. Um, thank you. Thank you, Farapa. I couldn't understand Bangla, but, um, and um, unfortunately, I, I can't see the chat box over here, so I could not see the translation. Me, it's fine. give you one minute summary if that's possible uh, it's not, it's an interest to kajolapa but she was basically sharing the experience of how uh, in the coastal areas they live with water and uh, how women have adapted and you know having faced uh, repeated uh, uh, disasters cyclones sidor and amfan and they managed to cope and she was talking about the adaptation and and the changes uh, that have come forward they are uh, they were also preparing for a covid response in the event of health crisis and so on it's a real real uh, i mean it's really unfair on kajalapa but uh, we're running out of time over to you hina uh, thank you very much um thank you action aid you know for inviting me um uh, for this um, interesting uh, conversation um focusing on water gender and covid uh it's a very interesting kind of a uh combination that you have brought in in terms of you know this uh, con- uh this dialogue one sentence that highlights a nexus between water gender and covid 19 i would say is 
prioritizing those in water stress settings. And by those, I mean the vulnerable and marginalized. And women and children basically feature high in ratio when you talk about vulnerable and marginalized. And when you talk about COVID in this context, regular hand washing is strongly recommended to combat um, the COVID-19 disease. And this necessitates access to sufficient, safe, and affordable water. And of course, you know, this means water, which is in addition to cooking, hydration, and general sanitation purposes. When you talk about SDGs, you know, this universal and equitable access to water, sanitation, hygiene is a critical public health issue um, and is being taken up, you know, by many countries head on. But when you talk about low and middle income countries, water infrastructure is substantially underfunded, particularly in informal settings such as slums and crowded settlements where access to water, adequate water is already a challenge. Here, I would like to link with the first presentation about values, which talked about rural uh, settlements. And when you bring in the COVID perspective, then urban settlements also become very prone to uh, challenges due to water unavailability. And also because, you know, uh, water is, like she said, um, you know, matters more for women as opposed to others. So they have an additional risk from COVID-19 due to overcrowded living conditions that promote disease transmission um, in urban settlements. And without access to safe water, COVID-19 could disproportionately affect individuals living in these settings. Uh, we talked about climate change as well and adaptation strategies. Climate change is an additional factor contributing to the challenges already posed by COVID-19. Unprecedented severe weather events in 2019 and 20 led to water stress um, on affected regions, including flooding, drought, cyclones, in addition to extended periods of significantly reduced rainfall. So these are all challenges due to water. And uh, a recent report, which has come up, um, out in 2020, which is based on a survey from 295 economists and from 79 countries, conducted by Oxfam is titled The Inequality Virus, bringing together a world torn apart by coronavirus through a fair, just, and sustainable economy. And it's interesting that the report highlights that uh, many of the experts, more than 80% of the experts, they believe that inequality in the country was going to increase significantly as a result of the pandemic and COVID-19. And gender inequality would likely or very likely increase as well. And uh, two thirds of the um, people who were surveyed felt that the governments did not have a plan in place to fight this inequality. So this is very interesting in the sense, you know, on one hand, you talk about value systems. And on the other hand, you also talk about inequality, which exists, you know, in many of our countries, especially in South Asia. Now, if you talk about the Global Gender Gap Index Report 2020, and you take an example of Pakistan, Pakistan ranks 151 out of 153 countries on this index. And if you look at the scorecard, and the country places Pakistan at 115 economic participation and opportunity. So now um, you can see that, you know, how women feature in terms of economic participation and opportunities. 143 in educational attainment, you know, in, and 149 in health survival and 93 in political empowerment. You see that women are already marginalized in countries such as Pakistan. And COVID is going to place another challenge in terms of uh, bringing these women uh, more, uh, much lower than they are right now. In health and survival, the gap widened by 95, 94%, which means that women in the country do not have the same access to healthcare as men. So when you talk about COVID, then you can see that, you know, um, the um, distance in terms of reaching to a health facility in rural areas is uh, huge. So if 94% uh, of the women already do not have the same access, what is challenge it's going to face? because of COVID-19. And uh, here I would like to highlight that COVID is coming out to be an additional factor. And it really, we need to think how we'll fare, you know, in the next few uh, months and years to come. 
when you talk about policies especially in countries such as pakistan and where water policies do exist they have been generally void of gender considerations there's lack of disaggregated data and many times this has been brought about you know as a major challenge as well and as highlighted as an impediment and gender has always been siloed and not mainstream effectively and now covid 19 adds an additional challenge and has made life abnormal i would say this will be more felt by urban population than rural uh, like you also heard water infrastructure is either unavailable or not effective in urban population population intensity is high households are mostly managed by women health implications uh, are going to be there as covid is a transmittable disease um and as many of men lose their jobs due to covid-19 it is also going to impact their livelihoods leading to other health and social issues such as domestic violence mental health children out of school especially girls would be the target because you know if you have an option in terms of sending your boy to school or a girl to school if you have limited income you would prefer to send your girls to school so these are going to be some additional challenges you know which are going to be um uh, we'll be facing in the a few days to come so now what can be done <clears throat> research to inform evidence based policy making it has been many times discussed but we always see that there's a broken triangle um there there are siloed and they're broken in terms of theme wise sector wise and institution wise there are many cso's civil society organizations which are working you know at the grassroots level but their link to develop or come up with research questions for academic institutions or research institutions to research and then the link to policy for evidence based policy making is broken so that's what probably we need to think about to identify research questions which can feed into policy making for more effectiveness then uh, we also see there synergies need to be created between different ministries and nine departments uh we have already seen that siloed approach don't work so you know how do these different ministries and departments come together and work together collaborative projects can be one option and needs to be designed in line with covid realities and gender considerations we know that old assumptions don't hold anymore and covid has added a layer of complexity need to think out of the box and need to think differently then public private partnership i think you know needs to be provo- promoted and enhanced to ensure that efficient and equitable allocation of water both in response to covid-19 and also going forward in terms of sustainably managing water use and ensure access to all those who need is going to be important we heard many examples you know um, and i think learning from best practices in terms of knowledge management is going to be very important and it's going to improvise based on and we can always improvise based on circumstances and conditions in our respective countries lastly i would like to highlight the two issues that were mentioned values and culture unfortunately when we talk about media or we talk about policy making we see that headlines in terms of numbers economic numbers do make headlines but when you talk about like faraba you mentioned non economic losses they don't really feature very much high so in terms of that i guess you know that remains a challenge that you know how do we bring in values and culture as an important consideration while we are designing programs or projects in terms of you know moving forward so these were a few words from me thank you very much thank you veena uh, because i want to finish at 5:30 um i will just take a few questions from the chat box uh, that i can see and uh, the questions so far are mainly for you catherine one is about um quantify values against the three factors you mentioned income food security and education are you with me catherine yes i'm here thank you so much okay so would you like to say a few words on that and then they go on to ask if you can mention some important government interventions to ensure water security for rural uh, uh, people in ethiopia so those are the two that i can see right now great so- thank you yeah i think they're really really interesting questions and i think the idea of quantifying values is 
It's a very difficult question. Um, so the approach that I presented was more about identifying the important contextual values in the communities and recognizing that there are a diversity of values that exist, um, that are gendered and exist across different contexts. Um, and then, so I think that's the starting point really. And then to move forward with quantification, it would be, it would require another study to go in um, perhaps with surveys and to collect different indicators of the values, variables that you're, um, that you're interested in, in order towards, to move towards quantification. But something that I've found perhaps more useful than quantification is prioritizing. So actually sitting down with community members and asking them to think about which values are the most important to them and finding a way to rank the values. And that can be useful for policymakers when trying to make decisions about um, how, how best to work in communities for community development. Um, so that's that might be an interesting uh, addition to take away. Um, the other thing in Ethiopia about interventions for rural water security, there is a huge amount of work going on, a huge, huge amount of donor investment in rural water supplies. Um, so we, in REACH, we work with UNICEF in Ethiopia and they have a program of multi-village schemes um, to, to provide a water supply to rural villages, uh, to lots of different rural villages at the same time, uh, which is something that we are looking to explore, um, explore further in REACH. And there's a huge emphasis as well on climate resilient wash for rural communities. Climate resilience is something that we see moving much more to the fore of policy um, due to the, the climate crisis. So I think really thinking about climate resilience and what that means, I mean, across the world really is something that can be very useful for rural water security. Thank you. Thank you. I want to leave you all with uh, another question. Uh, it says, if equal distribution of water can solve the problem stated in the presentations. I think um, Hina and many of you did bring up the issue of in inequality and uh, the inequity. And, you know, uh, uh, for the last two days, we have been talking about uh, equitable uh, access and distribution of water. So this is an aspiration and this is where we want to go. And I thought that, um, you know, uh, the pandemic, just as it is a, a huge disaster and it has changed and affected us, impacted on our lives in multiple ways, it can, could have been or can be an opportunity to move out of the old assumptions uh, that have continuously, repeatedly failed. And when it comes to looking at women and uh, participation of women in governance, women in decision-making, it has not been inclusive or it has not been gender sensitive. Whether we look at the uh, public services, we are struggling, we are campaigning for gender responsive public services. And therefore, when we talk about the water infrastructure or access to water in different settings, um, it does not factor in the whole uh, dimension of what it means for a woman, whether she is to collect water or the use uh, as a user of the water and so on. So there is need to do a lot more research and a lot more policy advocacy. And I think this is where uh, this international conference is trying to bring all of us together so that we learn from your research, we learn from your different uh, contributions and try and influence the political actors, the policy makers. But we also need to influence ourselves in, in terms of our mindset and respect water, river, because it's not a resource that's that is going to be there forever and forever for us to use, misuse and abuse. So I think we have to come with uh, our own mindset uh, uh, changed uh, and you know look for alternatives this that 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 is a critical and this will of course be uh, in in terms of adaptation or the socio ecological resilience building uh, respecting environment talking about uh, economics life and livelihood talking about water security but also about respecting and protecting the resources that we have. With these few words, I want to close this session and thank you 
all of you who have taken time and been here presenting. A thank you to all those who joined us to listen to the uh, uh, speakers. And thank you to all those who are on Facebook and live and other social platform. Over to you, uh, Faria. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Farakabi, for moderating the session and sharing the summary with us. And thank you again to all the presenters for presenting and also to, for responding to the questions. And with that, we are at the end of this session. We will now go for exactly a 30 minute break. We will meet you at the thematic session three, which is rights of rivers at 12 UTC and 6 p.m. Bangladesh Standard Time. Please follow the Zoom link share to join, or you can also join us on Facebook. Thank you so very much again to all the presenters and to all the participants for making this an engaging and fruitful session. We hope you all will stay with us for the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. <laughs>